Hey everyone. All right, this one's for Jody Mac. Rum and Coke engaged. Technically, it's rum and code red Mountain Dew. Because <clears throat> I have the palate of a 14-year-old. Um, but anyway, I'm Phil Helbertelli, and this is The Week in Doubt, episode 226. So as I mentioned on the Facebook page, I'm going to make a liar out of myself and discuss some social or political issues this week. Uh, I had just stated a couple of episodes back that I wanted to try to avoid uh, the kind of quote-unquote social justice minefield and stick more closely to topics like atheism and religion and tackling the big existential questions, etc. Uh, but what's that Pacino quote? Just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in. I had a friend and listener ask me what my take was on Milo's recent appearance on Real Time with Bill Maher, and then another friend and listener seemingly took offense at a meme I had posted. It was basically a picture of Indiana Jones punching a German soldier, and the caption read something like, punching Nazis, the most important part of any archaeological <laughs> expedition. And I think, to be completely honest, there was a mischievous part of me that knew some people might read something about Richard Spencer into it. And if you don't remember, or if you've been living in a cave, Richard Spencer is a controversial figure who many have labeled a white nationalist. I believe he himself rejects the label and prefers alt-right or identitarian. He made the news around the time of the recent presidential election for giving a pro-white or pro-white European speech and shouting, Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! In response, members of the crowd offered a Zig Heil gesture or salute. Uh, not that long ago, he was being interviewed on the street and someone came up uh, and out of nowhere punched him in the face on camera. Many on the left kind of rejoiced and a quote-unquote punching Nazis meme quickly sprang up. People on the right, or your anti-so-called SJW types, were quick to point out what they saw as the seeming hypocrisy of people on the left rejoicing in physical violence. And so this particular listener kind of called me out. I have listeners that lean left. I'd say the majority of them probably do so. Um, as is fairly common for non-believers, and I myself admittedly lean left on most issues, although I don't like identifying or affiliating myself with any particular party. But I also have listeners who lean to the right and who fall into that sort of anti-SJW camp. So it's quite the precarious tightrope act trying to simultaneously be true to myself while at the same time trying not to offend listeners on either side of the divide. It can be a little challenging, but I like to think I do a decent job. So anyway, I responded to the person by saying something to the effect that I knew people might read something into it, but it wasn't meant to be a comment on Spencer. And I went on to explain that although I try to steer clear of the whole quote-unquote quote, SJW versus anti-SJW thing, I am definitely not a Trump supporter. But I figured I might as well use this as an excuse to say what I do think about Richard Spencer. First off, I think he's somewhat intellectually dishonest in the sense that he seems to be one of those people who try to have their cake and eat it too. He claims not to be a white nationalist, but he's the president of the controversial National Policy Institute, what's been described as a white supremacist slash white nationalist think tank. And he tried to defend or downplay the Nazi-esque salute offered up by members of the crowd at the aforementioned conference at which he spoke by claiming it was meant in a spirit of quote-unquote irony and exuberance. So as far as I know, he won't refer to himself as a Nazi, but at the very same conference, he employed Nazi-era propaganda or catchphrases while defending Trump, such as Lugenpresse, meaning lying press in German, and the phrase, quote-unquote, victory of the will, reminiscent of the title of the Lenny Riefenstahl film, uh, Triumph of the Will. He also repeatedly referred to the white race as a race of conquerors, etc. So in a way, I think he's part troll. I think he knows he's flirting with fascism and Nazi propaganda, but likes the game of seeing if he can maintain just enough 
enough distance and ambiguity that he can't be nailed down for it. As someone who has Jewish friends and acquaintances and who likes to think of himself as a fairly decent human being, you can probably imagine why I might not be crazy about Spencer. As far as what I thought about him getting punched, I don't really think I felt any schadenfreude. Uh, There's a German word for you. Uh, There may have been a jaded, nihilistic part of me that thought, eh, more violence on the TV, who cares? And there may have also been a more decent part of me that was a bit put off by the pure animal violence of it. Even if you take exception at Spencer's views, um, I think there has to be something wrong with you to go up and slug someone in the face that you're not even in an immediate conflict or confrontation with. Just punch them out of nowhere because you take offense at something they've said in the past or whatever. I've known some people during my lifetime who were easily spurred to anger and violence, and it's not pretty, and they're not the type of people you'd necessarily want to spend a lot of time around. And I think the last time I ever laid hands on someone in anger, I was probably in my early 20s, maybe even a little younger, and we were all at a party at a friend's house. There was this girl I was going out with at the time. I was head over heels for her and all that, and I was in the kitchen with her when this member of our group who was known as a kind of troublemaker came up, and for some stupid reason, he called her either a bitch or the C word, And I got pissed, and I shoved him pretty damn hard. He ended up flying back and falling on his ass. And guess who got in trouble? This guy, as they say. The girl was mad at me for resorting to violence. I don't know what the point of this story is, other than trying to make myself look like a tough guy. Uh, Oh yeah, but (laughs) I remember. I I didn't necessarily feel very good about myself afterward. I felt like some brute who overreacted. And I've had friends who would get into fist fights while out clubbing, etc., and feel similarly afterwards. Uh, maybe the moral is simply don't go around hitting people. Okay, so now from Milo, and I recently re-released episode 174, by the way, in which I offer my response to Milo's appearance on the Joe Rogan show. Not a recent, uh, or is it uh, the Joe Rogan experience, rather? Not a recent appearance. Uh, That was about a year or so ago. And that brings me to something I found kind of amusing. I'm kind of a YouTube rat. I spend a lot of time watching shows like The Joe Rogan Experience and The Drunken Peasants. And I can remember Milo appearing on both of those shows a year or so ago, or whenever it was. And it's kind of funny as a YouTube viewer watching the mainstream media react like all this stuff with Milo is brand new. CNN, etc. talk about his appearance on The Drunken Peasants like it's some secret tape that just surfaced. It's been on YouTube for over a year with over a quarter of a million views. And so if I could take half a step back, as I mentioned at the top of the show, a friend and listener was interested in what I thought about Milo's appearance on Real Time. And I used to watch Real Time with Bill Maher religiously, no pun intended, but for some reason I've been having trouble rekindling my interest since the show returned from hiatus. But anyway, I went and watched the episode, and as I explained to the person who inquired about my thoughts, um, you know, I wasn't too surprised or impressed by the interview. I had already been aware of Milo, and he didn't say anything that I haven't heard him say before. And I often feel like the interview segment on Real Time just feels too short or that it's rushed and leaves you feeling unsatisfied or that there's more that should have or could have been said. And it's probably because of its placement right between Bill's monologue and the panel discussion. It's a cool segment, but kind of short form for an interview. But anyway, the same listener also made me aware that Milo also appeared on the Overtime segment, and I'm going to play that in a bit. But once again, in case you've been living in the proverbial cave, you're probably aware that Milo found himself embroiled in a brand new controversy shortly after his appearance on Real Time. And it has to do with a couple of those old appearances I alluded to. About a year or so ago, he made some controversial comments about sexual relationships between men and underage boys on both the Joe Rogan Experience and the Drunken Peasants podcast. And as I said, the mainstream media is suddenly acting like this is breaking news. Uh, Once again, these videos have been around for at least a year, and the comments are pretty much par for the course for Milo. 
If you're not familiar, Milo Yiannopoulos is a young British journalist. In a way, he's a bit of a walking contradiction. He's openly gay, flamboyantly so, very open almost to the point of braggadocio about his sex life and his wild partying. But on the other hand, he identifies as a practicing Catholic and holds some pretty conservative views. I noticed that during his recent appearance on Real Time, however, that he was rather sheepish or hesitant when asked if he was a conservative, but I'm pretty sure I've heard him him refer to himself as a conservative in the past. When I did that prior episode in response to his appearance on Joe Rogan's show, I actually didn't really discuss or critique any of his political views. In keeping with the usual format of the show, I really just addressed his comments on religion specifically, as far as I can remember. But in that interview, as I mentioned, he did make some of those controversial comments regarding gay relationships between men and boys that have now come back to haunt him. Even some of his ardent supporters have come out in opposition to his comments, including Stefan Molyneux, Stefan Molyneux, Stefan Malamute, and his friend Gavin McInnes. So basically what Milo said was that uh, when he was underage, he had had sexual relationships with adult men, one of them being a Catholic priest and I think the other being a drag queen. I think he may have been around 13 when he was involved with the aforementioned priest, and he spoke about it in a kind of cavalier or half-joking manner. I've repeatedly heard him make the joke that if it wasn't for Father Michael, he wouldn't know how to give nearly his good head or something like that. Uh, So, for the most part, he was speaking about his own experiences, but he also spoke more generally about man-boy relationships too, and that's what he's gotten in trouble for. People think that his comments or his attitudes seem to endorse or help normalize the sexual abuse of underage boys uh, by adult men. In the wake of this quote-unquote recent scandal, he was disinvited from speaking at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, uh, had his book deal canceled, and he was also forced to resign from Breitbart. So what do I think about Milo's comments? Well, I agree with his critics, including those on the same side of the political divide as Milo, that it's not right to glibly make comments that seem to normalize sexual abuse. And I think, and maybe it was on the drunken peasants, Milo tried to draw a distinction between quote-unquote consensual relationships between adults and teenagers and the abuse of prepubescent children, which is what he personally sees as uh, pedophilia. I think most uh, of us would agree, and I hate talking about this stuff, kind of creepy and depressing, but most of us would probably find it considerably more vile and morally abhorrent to sexually abuse a small child as opposed to an older teenager. But even if the teenage victim seems quote-unquote willing, there's still the disparity in age and life experience and usually a power differential. And according to the law, if the person is underage, even if well into their teens, it's still technically pedophilia. And I'm not a parent, but I can remember back to when I was in my early to mid-teens, and both mentally and physically, there was just a world of difference between that and an adult. I still had a lot of physical, mental, and emotional maturing to do, so I can see why people are criticizing Milo. But on the other hand, and here we go, I actually feel kind of bad for Milo. Even though I disagree with him on many things, I still have to admit I like his personality. I like how colorful and flamboyant he is, his fun-loving sense of humor. And although I'm a straight dude, he still seems like the type of guy I'd like to go out painting the town or drinking with as a friend. He might say some outrageous or even mean-spirited things, but I still think there's a certain kind of good-natured warmth and charm about him. Even when I strongly disagree with him, I still can't seem to muster the same level of ire towards him that I see others display. So, do I think his cavalier attitude about sexual relationships between grown men and underage boys is irresponsible and wrong-headed? Yes, I do. I, I mean, imagine if you're a parent and you find out that a priest or a teacher or a coach or some other adult male in a position of power, perhaps uh, anywhere between twice to four times your child's age, uh, has been trying to seduce them or has actually had sexual contact with them. You'd be through the roof. And to take it out of the realm of 
the theoretical for a moment. Think about when the gruesome details about the Sandusky case came out and how they made you feel. I remember feeling almost physically ill when I heard what a coaching assistant, I think it was, had walked in on when he discovered Jerry Sandusky in the showers with an underage boy. That being said, I have no reason to think that Milo himself is a uh, sexual predator or abuser. If anything, as others have said, uh, I think his cavalier attitude is his own way of trying to deal with or downplay the abuse he himself suffered. Not that that's an excuse to make light of such abuse, but I still found it a bit much when the mainstream media started hammering him while liberally associating him with the word pedophilia. And for those of you who think that perhaps I'm being too easy on Milo, well, I'm about to play that overtime uh, Bill Maher clip I mentioned earlier, and I promise you there will be some things that Milo has to say that I will take issue with. So here we go. All right. <laughs> well, let's start with you, Milo. Why did you single out a transgender student for ridicule during a recent speech you made on her campus? Did you do that? Well, yes. Uh, first of all, wasn't a student. Um, he had already left the university. And um, I make no apologies for um, protecting women and children right, from men who are confused about their sexual identity. Well, I'm confused about who this is because pronouns are so important. If you call Caitlyn Jenner he or a bad person. So yeah, this I is did a, it on purpose. You did. So this yeah. is a man I mis I who... I misgendered yeah, right. this person. Right. So this is a man, born man, who, who wants to... thinks that he might be a girl. Okay. And, and you um, have a problem with that? No, I don't have a problem with it, but I think that women and, ch and, and girls should be protected from having people, who, men who are confused about their sexual identities in their bathrooms. That that's, person... That's not unreasonable. That so there, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, we have Bill agreeing with Milo a bit. Then again, maybe it's not that surprising. Bill's a lefty, but he often goes against the politically correct tide, so to speak. So already I disagree with Milo on his characterization of transgender people. I don't think trans people are going into restrooms to molest or prey on small children. I think they're going in to use the bathroom. If anything, uh, they might be the ones who feel self-conscious and just want to get in and out as quickly as possible. Um, unless it's glaringly obvious that the person's trans, I'm picturing a woman in a miniskirt with a big ZZ top beard or something, I doubt it would probably be an issue you might not even notice. So I obviously don't think that a, that trans people in general pose any threat to women and girls. On the flip side, I don't want to seem insensitive to the concerns of some women. Say especially if you have a young woman maybe in high school or college who plays a sport and suddenly you find yourself changing alongside someone who is born biologically male. I can see why that might make someone feel nervous or self-conscious. Uh, but there's got to be some workaround, maybe stalls for people who want privacy or something like that. But anyway, let's get back to these guys. Person yeah. who was a, you know, an activist who took their own uh, university to court to force his way into the, chain, the, the female locker rooms had already left college by the time I gave that speech. And that was totally misreported by the press, just like they misreport everything else. Jack, where do you stand on weirdos, Pete? Well, it sounds like fake news. <laughs> Did you just call transgender people weirdos? Just to fuck with him. That's really rude. I, I think you two are doing a great job with this topic. I'm going <laughs> to keep going with it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I don't really know anything. I'm just a pop star. I just think it's sad because the same arguments that we use against gay people, treating them like aliens who just wanted to fuck anything that moved, and that's why we should avoid them at all costs. No, I think it's there's a big used, difference. Well, let me finish my thought, please. Um, you know... Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's true. There, there, there's a difference without a distinction because you're it's using the same type of arguments. It's like when people try to compare gay and black. Yeah, they're not the same thing. No. We share an invisibility. You know, people didn't see us in society, and gay people... Hid, in, hid out from society. Mm -hmm. right. But there were a lot of the, the same issues that you have to deal with when you're marginalized. We and now people that, can be discriminated well, against no, for That's a group reasons, that's right? marginalized, and so the attack, you can always find an extreme person that becomes the object of your attack to assign that to everybody. So if you say, well, that person is weird or they want to do, commit sexual assault, then everybody thinks all transgender people want to do is commit sexual assault. Well, they aren't disproportionately involved in those kinds well, of crimes. I, they're what? Vastly disproportionately involved in sex crime. Who is? Gender people? Yes. 
Of they course. What statistic? I, okay. I, I, I don't that's, know. That's, I, I, not, that's not a controversial statistic. So Milo sounds pretty sure of himself there. Uh, like the, the other members of the panel, uh, you can tell by the sound of their reactions. Uh, I was rather incredulous. Uh, so I tried to do some cursory research, and I don't know how reliable the sources are, how biased they might be, but the gist or the consensus seems to be that transgender people are far more likely to be the victims of sexual assault than the perpetrators. A couple of articles claim that in 35 years, there was only one supposed case of a transgender person sexually assaulting someone in a bathroom that was supposedly in Canada. Something here from the Office of Justice Programs, uh, the Office for Victims of Crime, ovc.gov. Statistics documenting transgender people's experience of sexual violence indicate shockingly high levels of sexual abuse and assault. One in two transgender individuals are sexually abused or assaulted at some point in their lives. Some reports estimate that transgender survivors may experience rates of sexual assault up to 66%. Often coupled with physical assaults or abuse, this indicates that the majority of transgender individuals are living with the aftermath of trauma and the fear of possible repeat victimization. Then it goes on to say 15% of transgender individuals report being sexually assaulted while in police custody or jail, which more than doubles for African-American transgender people. 5 to 9% of transgender survivors were sexually assaulted by police officers. Another 10% were, assault, were assaulted by healthcare professionals. Then it says that uh, penetrative uh, sexual assault can often be a component of anti-trans hate crimes. In fairness, this site, ovc.gov, doesn't seem to give a breakdown of what percentage of trans people might be sexual perpetrators. And the other sources I could find seem somewhat sympathetic towards trans people. Um, I wasn't seeing a, a lot of data, but I kept seeing the uh, repeatedly the assertion that trans people are much more likely to be the victims rather than the perpetrators of sexual abuse. And anecdotally, for what it's worth, that sounds right to me. I don't have any reason to doubt that. Um, it's in keeping what, with what, once again, I've heard throughout my life anecdotally. We hear a lot about sex crimes and or violent crime perpetrated against transgender people. And even though it seems like the news is always inundated with stories of child sexual abuse, I don't ever really call, recall hearing stories that stick out about trans people being the perpetrators. I like to try to keep this show as honest and fact-based as possible. So if anyone out there has any solid statistics either way or links they can send me, uh, please do. And I'll um, report back using that data on the next episode. But for now, once again, uh, let's get back to this uh, real-time clip. And it is a know, and frankly, statistic. and frankly, you know, you, you, you're, you're saying, you know, you're suggesting these people are the victims of some kind of discrimination. Well, I'm saying to you, this is a this is a psychiatric disorder. I didn't like, say discrimination. Like, you this said is a psychiatric disorder, I said like, I, like, multi, yeah, like right. identity I, I, disorder, I, I, or I like sociopathy you. or something. You know, I don't you know, want these people I'm, around I'm, little girls in Boston. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying here's terrifying. what I'm saying. I'm, I said this is what I said. The same argument we used against gay people. You should do your homework because it was wrong then. It's right now. That's perfectly no, no, no. Homosexuality was called a disorder. It was a psychological disorder. Maybe it is. I feel disordered. Okay, so homosexuality or being trans as a quote-unquote psychiatric disorder. Uh, I've spoken a lot on the show in the past about how I do concede that I think there can, in some cases, be cultural, social, or environmental factors or influences that determine a person's sexual identity or preference. Say to this day, there's still parts of the world, uh, I think in parts of the Muslim world, I think, where the genders are raised separately. And when you do that, you can end up with more same sex experimentation. I think sometimes similar behavior takes place in uh, boarding schools, etc. And if we go back to certain periods in the history of ancient Greece and things like that, or e other 
periods and cultures throughout history. We could find instances where homosexuality was more widely accepted and practiced. And I've often heard people like Dr. Drew Pinsky try to posit that sexual abuse early in life might have some determination on whether someone ends up identifying as gay or not. And Dr. Drew even has this kind of strange theory. You know, sometimes there are those um, gay men who do seem to fit that gay stereotype of almost like Milo, of like a flamboyant, feminized type of man, maybe uh, lispy, etc., you know. And P Dr. Drew Pinsky has a theory that he refers to this as almost like a little girl type of affect. And he thinks it's the product of young men being sexually abused at an early age. I don't know if I necessarily buy that. My gut intuition always was that maybe it's just something uh, biological. I think, um, I, think th I think there's definitely a biological component to sexual orientation and preference. Uh, I've often joked about how I knew from a very early age that I was into women. You know, no one had to tell me. Uh, if anything, you know, I was raised Catholic. And it was almost as if I was taught that sexuality in general was evil, you know? So it's not like anyone was trying to push me into formulating a sexual identity uh, one way or another, uh, at least not overtly. But I knew, you know, when I, when I was very young and I uh, first started to feel like butterflies when I'd make eye contact with the little girl sitting across from me in, you know, elementary school. And then I started to notice the curves of my female teachers and the curves of Suzanne Summers on uh, Three's Company, etc. <laughs> then I started to notice uh, when they began developing, you know, the girls in class, etc. So no one ever had to tell me to be straight. And I think the human sex drive is so strong that sexual preference must be, for the most part, biologically hardwired. As I said, there might be some flexibility uh, regarding environmental or cultural factors, but I'd be surprised if it wasn't biological for the most part. And if it really was just a matter of choice, I don't know why anyone would choose to be gay in a culture or society that is hostile to gays, you would have to truly be a masochist. Well, maybe you, maybe you are. Maybe it is. But most homosexuals are not. <laughs> you know what? No, I think I most gays, most gays have a long road, actually. I think, I mean, I, I, most gays have a long road to coming to terms with their sexuality, and yeah, because all of, of them the, end because up of the happy way about society it, treats no, them. No, of course it isn't. Don't be ridiculous. No, of course it's the way Don't society treats them. If society if said, I we're fine with gay no, people no, no, and it's no, no. 1890, you're, you're, you think in 1990 being, people are going to have being very obtuse. If I think that's Larry Wilmore there. I'm not really familiar with him. Uh, I think he's a comedian and writer. I agree with him that... I don't think gay people would have a hard time of it, at least not nearly as much, if society simply accepted them for who they are. And of course, that's the way the tide or momentum seems to be going currently, thankfully. I mean, imagine being a young person coming to the realization that you're gay or attracted to the same sex and having to worry about what your peers and your parents will think if they find out, or worrying that you're some kind of freak because society, perhaps even your own family and your religion, tell you that it's wrong to be attracted to who you're attracted to. If society accepted you for who you are, many of those concerns or causes of angst would be moot or wiped out. I no. can't okay. produce there a child with the question. person I love. Yes. If I exactly. can't produce a child. <laughs> All I know is this. I have one quick question. I'm not a journalist, and right. I may just be an old spy, but you were, t <laughs> you were talking about confusion. Were we talking about you? What? Because you sound very confused. You were talking about, about people being confused about their sexuality, their no, position in the world. No, I'm you know, I mean, I've been to Port Said in Naples, and you look like you've been there a few times. But... <laughs> Gotta admit, that joke went right over my head. Are, because you seem to be very yeah, confused you're, you're about who you are and what you are. You're the one, you you the one you pulling are. your wallet out, sweetheart. Yeah, that's um, all right, Chip, mate. Oh. No, I'm... Okay. <laughs> let, let See, do you always have to fight with everybody? I can't don't! You, can't we you were just having get such a nice time, but you always invite such awful people on your show. These are not... They're so stupid. Look at... 
no, come on. You need, to, you need to start uh, inviting <laughs> higher IQ guests, or this I'm is going to be a disaster. Yeah, these, That's what first, of all, first of all, wait. These, these are very high. Wait, hold on, Bill. You can go fuck yourself, all right? Yeah. You know? Okay, so this is where my sympathy from Milo uh, kind of kicks in again. Milo was kind of asking for that because he was referring to his fellow panelists as being stupid and awful, but I thought he was doing it in this kind of lighthearted, playful way. And it, it loses something when you don't have the visuals, but Larry Wilmore was really kind of venomous in that delivery. Uh, he does not like Milo Yiannopoulos. And I didn't think telling Milo to go fuck himself is as cathartic as it might have been for the audience. Uh, I don't think that really accomplishes anything. If this is the face if of the your Nazis, argument is that these people are stupid, you didn't hear a word this man said no. early in this segment because yes. he can talk circles around your right. pathetic, this guy. douchey little ass. For me. You know, once again, Larry Wilmore, obviously not a Milo fan. Um, I don't know if he's saying douchey little ass there, douchey or bougie. I, I don't know what he's saying. Defend. I'll let you defend it. <laughs> Leslie Jones is not barely literate. Go fuck yourself again for that oh, one. We okay? Are <laughs> she can okay, so now we're getting into the Leslie Jones thing, and you're probably, uh, most of you are probably aware that Leslie Jones uh, was an actress or a comedian who was in the recent reboot of Ghostbusters. And I think the controversy Milo ended up getting embroiled in uh, over her was what ultimately cost him uh, his Twitter account. And so Milo had fired off a, a few unfriendly tweets towards her, uh, mostly insulting her intelligence and, uh, you know, and, and insulting Ghostbusters. But I don't think Milo himself said anything racist. But his supporters, rather, pretty much smelled the blood in the water uh, followed his lead, but took it to a whole nother level. And there really were a lot of ugly, racist uh, tweets that ensued. But in fairness to Milo, I don't think Milo, as nasty as some of his tweets were to her, I don't think he himself brought race into it. Um, if you're listening and you know differently, uh, please correct me. But I'm probably going to end it here. So I guess... In conclusion, I'll say, that, yeah, I disagree with a lot of what Milo has to say, and I can understand why people resent his his comments and his views on things like uh, transgender people and homosexuality, etc. Um, but still, at the end of the day, uh, it just seems like he is it just me? He seems like he'd be like a really fun guy to hang around with and even a fun guy to, to go back and forth debating with. Uh, I think you can strongly disagree with someone and, and still be able to enjoy their company or whatever. So Milo will probably never hear this. Uh, but if you do, if you're ever in the Boston area, want to get shit faced, <laughs> let's do it. So you guys know the drill, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Um, if you want to help the show out monetarily, you can use the PayPal widget at the bottom of the Podbean page. I've been drinking this whole time, so almost uh, lost control of my tongue there. <laughs> that alliteration is dangerous. Or you can go to patreon.com slash the week in doubt and support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. Who knows, maybe someday uh, I can do this full-time. I would enjoy doing that a hell of a lot more than what I'm doing now for a day job. But anyway, uh, once again, thanks, guys. And until next week.